number 160, and we're still talking about the battle of the gods. As you have heard of this before, Larry, you, I'm sure you've heard about the plagues. Did you ever look at it as the battle of the gods? No. Yeah, the battle of the gods. It's a battle of gods. God is fighting and overcoming all of the gods of Egypt. There was nine penal plagues. Nine penal plagues and one death sentence. You know, in American justice, we used to found American justice upon the Bible. If a person committed a crime that was not a capital crime, he went to a penal colony. And a penal colony is a, uh, a prison, so to speak. And in a prison, they would make you work really hard. You had to work hard, and uh, you were basically a slave of the state. I don't know whether you know this or not, the Bush family and the, uh, their associates really financed the, the rise of Hitler in Germany. All the family, the Bush family, and their families they had married into uh, built up the Hitler's military complex. And when they went into one area there, there was a lot of coal and steel and things, and they were in, and the Bush families involved in all of that. And they founded a penal colony in Auschwitz. And there coal and steel companies were being supplied by slave labor. That way you can make a lot of profits when you have slave labor. A lot of profit by slave labor. Just study that just a little bit. Go back and look up there the, the different people that were involved with the Bushes and, and the financing Hitler. And they, by the way, they owned Remington Arms and they supplied the barrels to both sides of the, of the war even going all the way back to the Civil War. And almost all of these great big industrial giants at that time that in the, among the Bush family were Skull and Bones. And you've heard about the Bush family being part of Skull and Bones in Yale. Well, the Skull and Bones, it meant they were the American aristocracy. Their children were going to get the best education and they were going to control the destiny of the world. Well, we know that. But why in the world for 150 years have these people got by with crimes? Why weren't they exposed at Auschwitz, etc.? Now, God is about to expose Pharaoh for enslaving his people enslaving his people. That just give you a little bit of history of that as we go look. Read that. You might read uh, the Bush crime family. That will tell you the whole story of that. Wyomer Hadbar El Moshe Imbor El Aharon Neteh Et Yadika Bimatika Al Hanehara all Hayorim. We all Hagagamim. We all et Hatsfardim El Eretz Mitzrahim. And he said, Jehovah unto Moses, say unto Aaron. Aaron means what? Light. Light. Say unto Aaron, you stretch out your hand. Now remember that Moses kept telling up there on Mount Sinai, kept telling God, I can't speak well, I've got a speech impediment, and I don't want to do this. And he finally told him, shut up, Aaron's on his way. Just you tell Aaron, I'm going to make you a god to Aaron, and Aaron's going to be a prophet to all of Egypt. You just tell him what I tell you, and then he'll do it. And take this rod and put it in his hands. My power is in that rod. 
And so he says, uh, you stretch out your hand with your staff, see there the staff, over the rivers and over the canals and tributaries and the streams. And over the rivers, the, the reservoirs that is, the reservoirs is a pool of water. And you bring up the frogs upon the land of Egypt. Now, normally, in Egypt, the frogs were, you know, they would have floods in the springtime. The, the waters would melt and they would have all this, and, and the silt would come down and replenish the land, all this fresh ground. It was, it was a land that didn't need fertilizer and didn't need uh, rain because they had the floods, and the floods would flood the land, all the delta of the Nile, and after the floods came, then the frogs would come, normally. But God is going to inter intervene here and do something very different so it won't be just a natural thing. Uh, there was a natural thing in Egypt that they had red tide, and, and you can go out in the ocean and they have a red tide, but the red tide was called by God and exemplified, and it not only was a red tide, but it was a bloody red tide. And over all the pools and all the cisterns, and bring up the frogs, the hot sfardim, the frogs upon the lands of Mitzrayim, the red mud and canal banks. We got a word of Egypt out of the Greek word Egyptos. The frogs usually came in large numbers after the waters would reside or recede. Now the, the frog gods were Dafda, Rana, Masaika, Nalitika, and uh, Sitsun. Here God greatly multiplied their numbers. Way beyond normal. And the, the Egyptian prophets could not take away the frogs. They could create a frog, but they couldn't take them away. They could call a frog, but they couldn't take it away. Now, the further plagues of Egypt went... God had overpowered their powers. Now Satan has powers. I want you to understand the dark side of the world has powers. The dark side of the world is real. But God is over the dark powers too. He can restrain the dark powers. He can restrain them. And the Egyptian God of the resurrection was called Het which took the form of a frog. Now God is going to be over all of these gods. The frogs would cover all the land of Egypt. Epitaske. And with an outstretched hand, Aaron, with a rod over the waters of Egypt, and she went up. They call these now. A woman is uh, brings forth children. And here, and grammatically, a third person feminine singular cow while consecutive and perfect. The all of the frogs. She went up, and she covered the land, and they did with their same manner, the scribes or engravers, the, the, uh, the ones of secret arts. And remember, if you go back to the book of Enoch, you find out that the fallen angels taught mankind some of the secret arts of the dark world. And so they were performing miracles also, the Egyptians were, the Egyptians. And they brought up the frogs upon the land of Egypt. They did it too. They brought up, they called a frog, but they couldn't send them away. 
They could not send the frogs away. And from my people, I shall send away the people, and they shall sacrifice or slaughter to Jehovah. You tell them, I'll take these frogs away if they'll let my people go and sacrifice to me. And then said Moses unto Pharaoh, Glorify yourself over me, for when I shall entreat for you and for your servants and for my people to cut off, Pharaoh, I want you to tell me something. I want you to tell me something. Do you tell me when you want me to take the frogs away? Your Egyptian people, they can't send them away. They can, they can bring them, but they can't send them away. Now, I want you to tell me when you want me to send these frogs away. Tell me, and I'll do it. And let's see what Pharaoh says here now. I gotta get the next volume, but we'll read it from English right now. Exodus, the uh, eighth chapter. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did the same thing with their secret art. See, Satan can have power. These dark power. And the frogs came up and covered the land. And the magicians did the same thing with their secret arts, and they covered the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Moses and said to him, Entreat the Lord from me, remove the frogs from me, and from my people, and I will let your people go, that they may sacrifice slaughter to the Lord. And then Moses said to Pharaoh, The honor is yours. Glorify yourself. You glorify yourself now. And you tell me when I shall and I shall beg for you, the Lord, and your servants, and your people, and the frogs shall be destroyed from you and your houses, that they may be left only in the night. He said, When shall I do this? I can do it. They can't do it, but I can. They're going to go back into the Nile. And you know what Pharaoh said? Give me one more night with the frogs. <laughs> That's what he said. Give me one more night with the frogs. Then he said tomorrow, and he said, May it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like you, like the Lord your God. That no one is like the Lord our God and your God too. Pharaoh, Jehovah is your God. I remember a long time ago. See, I'm an old man, so I can remember a long time ago. I had a teacher named, named uh, Dr. Martin Van Buren Canavan. He was an Irishman, and he was a genius, a brilliant man. And he preached a song, a, a, a sermon. One more night with the frogs. One more night with the frogs. And he, they transmitted it over radio. He was, I think he was up by Sally or someplace pastoring up there at that time. And they were transmitting his words all up and down the San Joaquin Valley. And he preached his sermon one more night with the frogs. Now, he had a church member. That was a lady. And her husband, and I can't think of his name right now, he, was, he became a preacher. Her husband did. But her husband would not go to church at all. Period. He wouldn't go to church. And when Martin Cannon would come to his house, he'd just get out there in this old pickup he had, and he had this uh, railroad uh, iron that he would drag all over his property out there, and he'd be dragging the property, dragging the property. And he had a radio in that car, and he turned the radio on, and you know what channel it was on? He would listen to Martin Cannon preach. And he'd go out there, and he wouldn't 
and, and when Martin Kahneman approached him, he said, I don't want to be, he said, I don't want to go to church with all those hypocrites. I know those hypocrites. They gamble, they drink, they, they run around on each other, they do all this kind of stuff, and I don't want to be part of all of that at all. I don't want to be part of that. Well, when Martin Kahneman preached one more night with the frogs, he preached out there and he said, what is it going to take for you, God, to draw you. Do you want to take one more night with the frogs? Do you want to stay out there in the sin and in the world one more night? Or are you going to come in into the house of God? And Brother Martin Kahneman was preaching in the pulpit, and his this man's wife was in there. And the man, had, before she left, he was out there running around with his car, running around, dragging the place, dragging the place like five or ten acres, dragging this. Uh, railroad iron around, keeping down the weeds, you know, and flattening out the land. And he was listening to that sermon one more night with the frogs. And he heard that thing, and he just broke down. God broke his heart. And he rent, he, he disconnected that railroad iron. He took off in that truck and went to that church. And the church was just getting started. And he busted in the doors and ran that aisle, down that island and hit the altar of God. Just like that. And Martin Cannon was looking down at this guy. I haven't even preached yet. What happened here? I mean, I haven't even preached yet. He went down there and talked to him. He said, I haven't preached yet. He said, I want to be saved right now. I want to be saved right now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait for you to preach. I want to be saved right now. So, he talked with him and he asked the Lord to forgive him and save his soul and everything like that. And then he said, well, now go sit down with your wife. And he's tears coming down his eyes, eyes and everything. He went back there and sat with his wife, smiling. He listened to the sermon. The sermons weren't affecting his heart anymore because now he was saved. And then he did a very foolish thing afterwards. Brother Cameron says, Brother so-and-so, come up here. Now this preacher, I got a little more to tell you about him. Anyway, he came up there. And he said, uh, do you want to be baptized? He said, yes, I'd like to become a member of this church and I'd like to be baptized because I'm saved and I want to follow the Lord. Okay. All right. And so Brother Cadman uh, asked the church, do you want to accept him uh, as a candidate for baptism and after baptism, full rights and privileges of this church, etc., etc.? And he said, they voted to do that. And then he was up there and he was smiling and everything else. And then after the services, uh, uh, this guy, and I can't think of his name, and I'm sorry that I can't remember it. But he came up there and he said, Brother Cadman, what, what am I supposed to do? He said, do everything that you told me these church members didn't do. <laughs> you know what you're supposed to do. Do it. About six months later, he, he, he walked up the aisle and again, up to the aisle up there to the, and got down and prayed. And Brother Madden, or brother uh, Kahneman said, what do you want this time, brother? And he said, God's calling me to preach. And so he surrendered and he went to school down in Bellflower, California. And uh, he saw Brother Matt, uh, Brother Kahneman a few weeks later, and he said, I'm going to be a greater preacher than you are, brother. <laughs> he said, I hope you are. I hope you are. He said, I was out there, and I fought God all this time. I fought God, and I fought God, and I fought God. And I was losing. I finally gave in because I knew if I didn't be saved that day, at that minute, I may be damned for hell forever like Pharaoh was. Well, he went to the seminary. He became a great preacher. And then he was, his, his, his journey came to an end. I don't know whether you remember this or not, but uh, he was fishing in Lake Isabella, and a storm came up, and the boat capsized, and he drowned. Mm -hmm. That was a, a bad thing, but you know what? His journey was... His journey was finished. That was the end. Of, that was the end. He had finished his journey. I'm gonna walk over here, show you something. <clears throat> this.
This is a plaque that was given to me by a man by the name So. And on the back of it is a postcard from Korea. I'll tell you a little bit about this man. Brother So, and there's two messages by him on discovertheword.com and discovertheword with Dr. Jim.com and sermonaudio.com slash DTW. It's not on, on the YouTube website because it's audio only. And I don't have very many audio only because I can't put them up myself. I have to get somebody else to do it. This was uh, get, March the 1st, 1978. Dear Brother Phillips, thank you very much for your kindness <clears throat> and Christian love that you have shown me during my study at CMBI. I came back to Korea to uh, open a Bible school and to teach our missionary Baptist doctrines to all preachers and students. I am busy but happy. would like to tell my sincere appreciation and gratitude to you and your church and Hebrew class and Greek class. Please come and visit Korea. God bless you and your church and your Hebrew and Greek classes. Not long after he wrote this letter to me back here, he had a stroke and died. Five years he sent in the seminary. <coughs> well, away from his time, he never went back to his wife one time. He said five years in America going to the seminary and studying. I was his Greek and Hebrew teacher. And a man knew every Middle East language and every Oriental language you could think of. I made a mistake one time with Brother Solo. He came and preached for me, and that sermon is on sermon audio. And we went down to build these bamboo chopsticks in Bakersfield, California. And Brother Soul could speak Japanese, Chinese, all the dialects of Chinese, and Korean and all of that. And he, he could get up on the blackboard, I'd have him get up there and he'd write down one word in English, Latin, Russian, German, Korean, Chinese, and tell you all the roots behind it. Flyberg asked, man, I'm supposed to be teaching him. <laughs> I'm supposed to be teaching him. This genius. I took him down there to build these bamboo chopsticks and I said, Brother So, order food for us. So they got the chef to come out, and he was speaking to the chef in Chinese. And pretty soon, here comes all this food. And this is in 1977, probably. And uh, first of all, they bring this big thing of soup out there. And it was bird's nest and shark fin soup. And I ate it. I wasn't really excited about eating bird's nest because it's bird spit. I didn't even know what it was at that time. But we had that, we had all kinds of delicacies. Then they brought the bill to me afterwards. Remember, this is 1977. It was $175. <laughs> then I go back to my church and I say, <laughs> And what are you doing? I said, well, I had him order. And I didn't know what he was saying. He was talking in Chinese. I had no idea. Bird's nest soup is the, one of the most valuable items in the world. But last, did you ever hear of bird's nest soup? I did a sermon here uh, in 1980, I think it was, on bird's nest soup down at the Fish Lake Valley Baptist Mission. Bird's nest soup. And I talked about that. But Brother Soul gave five years of his life studying. We don't know how long we got in this world. We don't know how long we got. Marilyn's birthday was yesterday, and she is old. Been here on this earth for a long time, haven't you? Long, long time. Mm -hmm. I'm ancient, so to speak. A uh, hundred years ago, hardly anybody ever lived as long as we have lived. And Larry, you're getting up there also. <coughs> We've been blessed with long lives, but that is an exception. 
The Lord says that he gives us 70 years to live. <coughs> and if you make 70 years, sometimes you're lucky. Oh, I got cancer when I was 54 years old. And God saw to leave me here to do his job, to do his business. <coughs> and if you're in the world today, wherever you are out there, God's got something for you to do. He does. <coughs> Whether you live 70, 80, or 30, or 40 years. I think Brother Soul was in his 50s. And I want you to understand, that man, his body was like a wall. He was a black belt in whatever they, he was a black belt in, in martial arts. He was like, like iron. And yet, his health, the way he lived, the way he exercised, you could see him exercising, doing all the martial arts things. In Korea and Japan and stuff, they do martial arts along with their knives and guns that they shoot. Well, he was a black belt, and his son was too. And I had a, another student from Korea in my class in Bakersfield, California. His name was A. Park, and he was a black belt. All of these go, everybody's in the military, and you earn all these martial arts. And it's supposed to give you strength and, and life and the ability to protect yourself. Brother Roy Reed uh, went over to Korea when Brother So died. And his family said goodbye to him. And this was a terrible thing to see this man spend five years of his life going to go over there to build a seminary and nobody's there that can take his place at all. He went over there and they took his body and they washed his body. And they put him, and they cried. All of them were just crying and crying and crying, just letting all of their feelings come out. And they buried him, and every one of them put dirt over the grave, and they, and they did that. Then afterward, his son surrendered to the ministry. And I got to teach his son. His son was not brilliant like he was. He was brilliant, but not to the extent that his father was. But God passes on the baton. And sometimes we want one more night with the frogs, don't we? <laughs> when we can say, get them out of here. You can surrender your life to God and say, here I am, I'm yours. Or you can say, one more night with the frogs. And fight God like Pharaoh did. It's up to you what you do with your life. Our Father, we send this message out one more night with the cross. That you might honor and glorify it. I believe that you, I, I pray that you touch lives all over the world with it. Help them to surrender their lives to you and follow you. Because we don't know whether we got one more day or one more year or one more day in our lives. Help us to serve you and glorify you and honor you with our lives. Help us to learn the lessons from the Old Testament that it might honor and glorify you. And even those that lived then, Moses and Aaron still live on in our memories and what they did so many hundreds of years ago. Please forgive me where I failed you.